The ancient Egyptians believed the body had to last forever. Without it, the deceased could not rise again in the next world to enjoy eternal life. To prevent decay, the bodies of the dead were drained of moisture and reduced to the consistency of leather. Everyone wanted to be mummified. There may have been cut-rate embalming for the poor, first-class treatment for the rich. Even animals were mummified to accompany the dead on their final journey. Over some 30 centuries, countless mummies were made, but countless were also destroyed. Almost from the moment they were sealed, the pyramids and nearly every other well-appointed tomb were ransacked by thieves. Kings or commoners, bodies were hacked apart and left in tatters. Things got worse when Europe developed a taste for mummies. By the 12th century, they were imported by the ton to be ground up and mixed in potions purported to cure everything from headaches to impotence. In 1798, Napoleon's campaign spawned a new wave of mummy mania. Over the next century, hundreds were dissected both in laboratories and at fashionable unwrapping parties. The supply seemed endless. Mummies made cheap fertilizer and fuel. In the 19th century, trains from Cairo burned stacks of them to power their steam boilers. Our fascination with mummies continued unabashed well into the 20th century. Is it dead or alive? Human or inhuman, you'll know, you'll see, you'll feel the awful, creeping, crawling terror that stands your hair on end and brings a scream to your lips. <laughs> the Mummy. Today, Egypt's mummies are treated as fragile time capsules. Science now has the tools to explore their secrets without destroying them. Can I take this side off right here? Too? Researchers can coax clues about daily life 3,000 years ago from the tiniest samples of tissue and bone. Egyptologist Bob Breyer of Long Island University knows more than most about mummies. But just how a mummy became a mummy was a question that irked him for years. The party line among Egyptologists was always, oh, we know how they did it. They removed the brain through the nose. They removed the internal organs. We know pretty much how they did it. But there's no papyrus that tells how to mummify a human. The Egyptians never wrote down how they did it. It was a secret, probably a trade secret. A brief description was recorded by Greek historian Herodotus around 450 B.C. For Briar, it was not the final word. I started to do a mental mummification, trying to just imagine exactly what happened. At some point I realized the only way we'll ever really find out is to do it. In 1994, Breyer set about to perform the first Egyptian-style mummification in 2,000 years. In Cairo, he tracked down the embalming spices mentioned by Herodotus, including frankincense and myrrh. He would also need special equipment. We had to have replica tools made of all the instruments we thought the embalmers used. So, for example, we had to have obsidian, an obsidian blade flaked by somebody in the southwest who knew how to do this. We had to have a silversmith make bronze tools just like ancient Egyptian bronze tools. Not since the time of Sneferu has its light been done. Now, I'm a little bigger than the average Egyptian, 
Copying ancient designs, Breyer built an embalming board for the elevation of the corpse and drainage of fluids. And I'll tell you, it might be good for the dead, but it's not good for the living. With his colleague Ronald Wade at the University of Maryland Medical School, Breyer would mummify a man who had donated his remains to science. There were quite a few surprises along the way as we did the mummification. One was in removing the brain. Everybody always thought that and you kind of pull the brain out a piece at a time through the nose. At least that's how all the articles say it was done. We tried it. It didn't come out that way. Well, we figured out what the ancient Egyptians did was they inserted the long hook and then moved it around using it like a whisk and then broke down the brain into it was almost like a, a milkshake consistency and then turned the cadaver upside down and then the brain ran out. That's how they did it. Internal organs were removed through an incision made with an obsidian blade, sharp as any modern scalpel. Then the body was covered with several hundred pounds of natron, a naturally occurring salt Briar had imported from Egypt. Left in place for about a month, the natron was supposed to leach all moisture from the body. For Briar, the suspense was overwhelming. What would we get? Would it look like a mummy? Or would it need another 3,000 years before it looked like the things in the museums? One of the things that was really almost shocking was when we took the natron off, we had a mummy. Yeah. A striking demonstration that people are mostly water. The body would shrink from more than 160 pounds to just 45. What, what are the oils in it, Bob? The oils are frankincense, myrrh oil, palm oil, lotus oil, and cedar oil. There are five that I got. Briar anointed the body with oils considered sacred by the Egyptians, then began wrapping. Nice and tight. Accurate to the last detail, he used more than a hundred yards of pure linen inscribed with Egyptian spells. A lot of people don't realize that we did the project not to get the mummy, but to get knowledge. And the project isn't over. Our mummy, it seems, is what we say dead and well. He's been at room temperature now for about two years. No signs of decay. It's stable. So we think we did it right. But he's still being used in research projects around the world. We get requests for tissue samples, uh, people doing studies on ancient Egyptian mummies. This is the only mummy in the world for which we know exactly what was done to it. It's the only, so to speak, ancient Egyptian mummy that we have a full medical record on. So it's an important mummy. If only in the annals of science, Briar's mummy has achieved immortality, a fate the Egyptians would surely have approved.